Hi, I'm Adrienne Brodeur, and I'm the author of Wild Game, My Mother, Her Lover, and Me. And I'm Julia Whalen, and I am the narrator of Wild Game. And we're here today to talk about uh, the process of how this beautifully haunting memoir about Adrienne's mother Malabar's decades-long affair uh, had repercussions throughout the rest of her life. So, this book begins with a very important moment in your life, the kind of inciting incident, is that your mother comes into your room and wakes you up and tells you that your stepfather's best friend, who is married, has just kissed her. And this kicks off decades, really, of you hiding their affair from the world, um, but also facilitating it in some ways. So what made you finally commit to writing the story, to exploring it, to making it public? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and why? <laughs> and why? And why? Um, well, I think I'd have to back up for a second and say that with memoir, I think you don't get any credit for the events of your life. It's really about the consciousness you bring to those events. It's about why you think those ha events happened and what you make of them. And so I will say that I have been noodling around in this territory for much of my adult life. I've thought a great deal about it over the years. The process of this book, you know, the, the processing part took, you know, decades. Um, but why memoir and why now really, I think largely came down to the fact that um, I wanted to start a family. And I think in doing so, I had thought that I'd managed this, to get a, mm -hmm. get a grip on a lot of this. I mean, I'd been in therapy, I've done a lot of reading, I have great friends to talk to about it. But it was the actual moment of having children and feeling you know, a real sense of fear that I might unwittingly do some harm or do some damage. And I knew with certainty that as much as I love my mother, I did not want to mother as I'd been mothered. That makes sense. So, and spotlight on you, how different is it to narrate memoir than it is to narrate fiction? Well, that's interesting. First of all, I think with something like this, your, your prose is so good, it's, it's, it stands alone as a piece of writing, that it doesn't feel kind of typical diarist memoir. Like it feels that there is a, there's a consciousness about story, um, there's a thoughtfulness. It's just beautifully written. Cute. Well, that's true. <laughs> so um, for me, I'm able to jump in as if it were fiction almost, that this is just, I'm telling this story and I'm, I'm inhabiting the story the way I normally would. I do think I feel, though, a greater sense of responsibility to get certain details right or make sure that I'm doing right by you. Um, whereas with fiction, I might, I might be able to say, I think I can help the author, like I can nudge this a little bit further in the direction that the author is intending with a performance. With, with memoir, I, I kind of, I'm a little more back-footed, I think, than I am with fiction. Um, like when we had our, our kind of preliminary phone call about tackling this, mm -hmm. and I asked you a couple of questions, which is that your Ben, the mm -hmm. your your mother's paramour, mm -hmm. um, has kind of a catchphrase when he enters a room, and I had said, "Can you please tell me what that sounds like?" Because I I want to get that because I think it's a key to the character, um, and you very helpfully obliged. Um, and even with your your mother's. Um, the way you've written her dialogue, my instinct was that she was very fast. And it seemed to me that she kind of gets out ahead of herself. Mm -hmm. um, because I think she's, the, she's a person who, if she slows down, would have to think about what she's doing. Yes. And that came out in the rhythm of her speech to me, but I wanted to make sure that that was right. right. And not to give anything away, but when we get to the end of the book and you said she's so halting now, that it's that sat with me, that really comes home when I got to that part in the recording. I was like, oh my God, it's almost, it's almost painful because you can feel her processing just slowing down. Right. Um, you narrate the acknowledgments and the author's note in this. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, it's always to me, especially with memoir, it's like a gift. I feel like I've been given a gift when somebody allows me to narrate their story, but 
What was the um, reasoning for you not recording the whole thing? Right. Well, first of all, I too think it's a gift that you've narrated <laughs> <laughs> this book. So thank yeah. you so much for doing it. Um, the truth is, my mother at this point in her life is gravely ill. It honestly came down to time. It came down to, did I think I would be able to just commit the week or two that it would take with my job, with my children, with you know making these very frequent runs to Cape Cod to see my mother. And I just thought it was one of the things I could take off my plate. I, I think I would have loved to try, but I also feel 100% <laughs> confident that um, you have done a better job than I could have. And I really, it, it gave me a great piece. I mean, I didn't realize how nervous I was about it until actually I'd made that decision and, and you took it on. Well, thank you. I don't, I mean, I, I think that there's something to be said. Any, anybody who, any author who I've kind of, because I direct occasionally and mm -hmm. when I get an author read and, you know, getting them used to even just the, the mechanics of narrating while also being embedded in their story and kind right. of having to relive it again can be more challenging than I think people expect it to be. Well, but absolutely every author I met who's done it told me it was one of the hardest things that they've done. <laughs> right. I think we all think, like, oh, I'll read, you know, I read yeah. my children a bedtime yeah. story, I'll read my book as, yeah. No, that does not sound like how anyone has described the process. Interesting. So question though, going back to, uh, you decide to write a memoir. Now you have written fiction before, mm -hmm. you have your, you've been very embedded in the literary community. Yes. So what made you choose to say, no, I'm going to I'm going to commit to this. It's going to be memoir. I'm not going to fictionalize it. I'm not going to, you know, couch it as any I want to own this story and represent it that way. Right. What was that process? Um I think over the years I did try to tackle it in many ways, uh, you know, many long before I was prepared to tackle it. So much of my life I wrote about it just in my journals. Um, in my 20s, I have a few just horrible short stories, um, very overwrought short stories where I'm... Don't where we I'm, all. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and then there was a period in my life that I really tried to deal with it with humor. Um, you know, I wrote a draft romantic comedy about, um, you know, the situation. Yuck, yuck. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And what I think I was doing at the time, and I think what all of a lot of us do with humor, is we're trying to mask the real pain that the situation um, that the situation has for us. And in some ways, I think the longer we suppress and tamp down and deny our stories, the more power they have over us. And I really believe that when I made the decision to turn towards it and face it sort of head on as memoir, it really it really allowed me to kind of get ahead of it and get out from under it and mm. to, you know, just tackle my future in a different way. So it was very, um, you know, yes, it is scary to, to tackle it in memoir. You, you don't really have anything to hide behind. Um, but I think it's been a very uh, healing and powerful thing to have done. Interesting. Now, and both of your parents were writers yep. um, in different ways. Your father wrote nonfiction, mm -hmm. um, essayist mostly. Or did uh, he, do? he wrote uh, he wrote short stories, novels, oh, and nonfiction. Okay. He's most well known as a New Yorker writer, and he wrote journalistic pieces on you know everything from the asbestos industry and um, John's Manville and electromagnetic radiation, kind of a science writer. Okay, and your your mother is a food writer. Food and travel. Food yeah. and travel. Living the life. I know, right? <laughs> um, and you got very into fiction early on. That seems yes. to have been you were attracted to stories and that. What do you do? You think that that was part of just broadening your kind of literary education? Well, I think it started with a huge denial of literary right. education. I think my first step was I am not going to follow in either of these people's <laughs> footsteps. I am, you know, going to go a whole new way. I actually my first jobs out of college were um, working for an elected official in California. I went on to get a master's in public policy. Um, and then I had this wonderful person in my life who is my second stepmother um, who owned an independent bookstore. And she in my 20s started pressing novels into my hands. And it was life altering for me um, reading these books. And it was it came at a time when I was really 
fully facing some of some of the past already and I, you know, I was having a very hard time with it and reading these books made me or allowed me to kind of leave the bubble of my own experience and enter into you know different characters lives and see how they were tackling their issues and I think that not only helped me personally but also, at some point in time, I noticed, you know, if there were two stacks on my bedside table, the political journals were going yeah. down and the literary journals were going up. And I, um, I made a choice to sort of pivot towards that. And in my late 20s, I, I you know, left a career that I'd sort of gotten reasonably established in um, to return to New York and try to break into the literary world. Any Not regrets? easy. <laughs> Any regrets? No. No regrets. Yeah. No regrets. I've loved working in literary world. Yeah. I think one of the things that makes this story feel so literary to me is your attention to detail in many ways. I mean, your characters, it's hard to even call them characters, but they're so <laughs> well drawn. Um, but the setting of Cape Cod specifically mm -hmm. is so evocative and so well done. Um, how important is that to, to the story for you as a setting? I mean, it's important on a couple of ways. First, you know, it is where these events happened. <laughs> it is where this kiss took place. It is where most of the rendezvous and the testing of recipes um, and, and all the things that went into this romance, so much of them started on the Cape. But also for me, just as a person, the Cape quite simply is home to me. I was I was born in New York, but my parents split up, so I moved with my mom to Massachusetts, and I would go back to New York, and my father had a house in Connecticut. But if there was one stable place throughout it all where I have spent every summer of my entire life and many weekends in the winter, it's been Cape Cod. And I'm, I'm one of those people who just you know, I have almost a Pavlov's dog reaction yeah. when I start going over the bridge of just, you know, the brackish Yeah, the window goes and down and just, the yeah. Me, yeah. And it, it feels like home. I feel relaxed, blood pressure goes down. I It just is my happy place. I think that's also, it marks time in the book because it's every summer yes. you're returning there. And so you're, you are able to kind of travel through this really decades long event. Yeah by marking it as summers on Cape Cod. Yep. Um, obviously the other thing that is incredibly well drawn in the book is the food. <laughs> um, your mother being your mother is constantly cooking and it's just this, this explosion of flavor and um, materials and I just, I was so hungry. When I was prepping the book, I was just getting so hungry and when I was recording, my stomach would growl constantly <laughs> and I kept having to step out and like eat something and just like calm it. Um, and how did you, did you remember most of, I mean, do you, your memories of her in the kitchen are obviously very vivid, but do you, how did you kind of replicate or go back and remember what it was you were actually eating? Yeah. <laughs> Unless you have some food photographic memory, that, which is possible. Um, if you ate Malabar's food, you would have a photographic uh. memory. I mean, every meal my mother prepared really was an epic production. It just was never like, here's, you know, right. some mac <laughs> Chicken and cheese, nuggets, here's yeah. <laughs> something or other. So part of it is just that. She came alive in the kitchen. She was, you know, in command in the kitchen. She was also just extraordinary in the kitchen. So she'd studied at Le Cordon Bleu. She had um, worked in the foods of the world, the test kitchen of um, Time Life Foods of the World. And she was writing cookbooks my entire childhood. So there were all these, um, you know, test nights, we called them. And, you know, sometimes we were like, oh, is it a test night? Because, you know, we didn't want to have tongue for dinner right. or something like that. <laughs> Um, but mostly they were exciting and when I, I mean, so how I can remember all of them, I mean, some were just standouts that I, I remember things by meals. I mean, I, I admire <laughs> the people who don't think of food. I mean, I'm thinking of food right now. I, I go from one meal and I'm thinking about what the next will be. That's just I was looking I at my map of Boston and I had all these starred places on it and I was like, what is this? Was this a hotel? And I'm zooming in. I'm like, oh no, they were all restaurants. It was like restaurant, restaurant, yeah. Okay. Right. But I mean, you know, it, when my mother was testing for the Wild Game cookbook, for instance, I would come home from wherever I'd been, whether I'd been off with friends or working at a restaurant or something. And, you know, just to give you an example of a night. So there might be 
five little game hens, and one might have been injected with cranberry, and one with garlic, and one might have sage leaves under it. And I would come home, and of course, the adults were three sheets to the wind, having been drinking these fantastic martinis and then wine. And I was often sort of the tiebreaker in just tasting these miraculous meals. But it was just, it was great fun, and it was sort of a great part of my childhood. And every now and then, I, I think, you know, am I? And, and often dinners weren't served till so late at night. I mean, and I often with my own kids, I'm like, Am I doing something wrong with just the standard <laughs> meals at 6 p.m.? Well, that was something that actually kind of resonated with me when I was reading the book, and it, it hit me on, not on the prep read, but on the recording read, was that I think in, in memoir, but often just when we talk about mothers, food is always tied to it, and, and I think there's probably, you know, some like writing classes on, mm -hmm. you know, how to, how to portray your mother through the use of food because it's always this nourishing, you know, you should really eat something kind yeah. of mother relationship. And what I thought was so fascinating is that this was Malabar's version of food. Like, yes, she was putting food on the table and yes, it was doing everything food is supposed to do, but it was also not exactly child friendly. No. Really more about Malabar, it was Malabar's show. Right. And so this kind of like inaccessible, really, um, mature food that was being served to you at the time just kind of it, that struck me as I was recording. Oh, and me too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there were some great moments. Like, I remember for about a year, she was testing donut recipes to make the perfect donut. So, we did have some oh, joyful moments great. in there as well. But, yeah, no, I mean, I remember just thinking, could I try a Swanson frozen dinner, please? You know, just <laughs> once. I mean, I don't think. I don't think we ever had chips or any of the typical things that people have in the house. We d they were not part of my childhood home, ever, ever. Was that a conscious that when you when you had children and like you said, not wanting to you know wanting to do the work ahead of time, process this so that you're able to break cycles? Um, was food was that a part of it? Not so much. I mean, I actually, I'm not Malabar. I'm not that kind of person in the kitchen, but I do really love to cook. I've cooked all my life. I'm pretty competent. And I actually am one of those people who find it relaxing. You know, hard day work, just chop a lot of stuff. It's <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, it, this is sort of a little off topic, but my daughter just went on one of these outward bound style two weeks of camping and she's in ninth grade. And right before she left, we got this sort of charming list of, you know, really, possibly you should teach your children how to cut vegetables or maybe how to boil water. And I was thinking, give her a blowtorch. She knows how to right. do creme brulee. But right. I mean, food, we just, it's part of our lives. So yeah. it's, its um, I, you know, I don't, I don't make either of my children eat tongue. Right. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not hardcore about having to finish every little thing on your plate and those sort of much more 1970s style right. uh, parenting. But, you know, no, I love food. Oh. So I understand why this was important for you, for your own reasons, to write this story and to process it. Um, what do you think other people can glean from it? What are you hoping that people take away? I mean, I think I should say that when I wrote this book, you know, no one was waiting for it, right? It wasn't as if I sort of was sitting there thinking of, you know, what will people think and what will the audience be? I didn't have an agent at the time. So I wrote this book very much sort of as something I needed to do personally and alone in a room and so on. And I was just as surprised as I could possibly be that it resonated quite so strongly because of course, you know, to me, I thought I'd written an incredibly specific and singular mother-daughter story. Right. I don't know a lot of people who have been sort of complicit in their mother's love affair or abetted them in that process. Um, but as I think about it more, of course, you know, the very specific is, of course, what's general, what's universal. And I think what happened in all of this is that you know, most of us have mothers, and it's an incredibly powerful role, and it's um, it's a complicated role, and I, and I think many people, even who didn't do exactly what I did, can relate to some of the problems of that. So if there's, you know, a big takeaway, which of course I didn't write it with a takeaway in mind, but I would say, I'd say there are a few. Um, 
<laughs> one, they, all of which sound very obvious to me now, but I think, you know, secrets are really corrosive. I mean, we've all heard that, but yeah. actually, whether you're on the holding end of it or the receiving end of it, when you keep a secret from someone you love, you are actually doing harm to yourself. You are keeping yourself from being known. And what, what worse thing can be done for intimacy than hiding big parts of yourself? I'd say the other, the other thing, which also sort of borders on cliche, is that you know we're all better than our worst moments. Um, you know, one of the things, sort of PSA announcement, I mean, my heart expanded writing this book. And I think how that happened was actually getting into my mother's shoes, really spending some time understanding her. And, and through this, this thing, empathy happened, of course, you know, really, and, and forgiveness took a back seat to trying to find that empathy. And, and that was magical. And then I think the last thing is really that, um, you know, I, I might have touched on it before, but that the more we hold our stories in, the more they rule us, and the more we can share them, I think the more we take their power away. And I think sharing our stories is really about sharing our humanity. And I think it's only a good thing. Growing up, getting closer to the age that your mother was during these events, does it make it less understandable what she did, or more understandable, or both? I mean, all of it makes it more understandable to me, certainly. Um, you know, putting myself in her shoes, as I said, I mean, as glamorous as her name and her life might have sounded, I mean, she had a hugely traumatic childhood. Her parents were married, divorced, married, divorced to each other. So twice married, twice divorced by the time she was in high school. She found out her father had a secret second family. You know, she had an unhappy marriage to my father. She lost her first child. This is all before I actually came right. into her life or ever knew her. And so, yes, I have like a bounty of sympathy and empathy. And not that, that any of that makes it okay what she did to me. I mean, on the flip side, there's this, you know, magical collision, which is my own daughter just turned 14, which is exactly the age I was when my mother woke me up to involve her in her affair. And almost on a daily basis, I look at her and I'm like, hmm, <laughs> you know, what, what could possibly be a moment that would ever cause me to wake her up or to change the balance of our life? Because the moment that that happened with my mother, I mean, I understood it. I didn't understand that it was going to go on to be an epic love affair. I didn't understand that I was going to be involved. But I understood in real time that night that my life would never be the same, that I'd gone to bed as my mother's daughter and I had woken up as her best friend and confidant and co-conspirator. Co-conspirator. You know, entirely what it is. That's amazing. Yeah. So your day job as being kind of literary ambassador and bringing people from um, all walks of the literary life together um, to talk craft. Uh, when you said, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to do this, what were the, who were the people or what were the texts that helped guide you along the way? The piece of writing advice that, that hit me the strongest was in Vivian Gornick's book, The Situation and the Story. And that was, and I believe it was in reference, she was talking about a, a mother-daughter story uh, and possibly even mentioned Mommy Dearest. But the actual line was, in order for the drama to deepen, you must show the loneliness of the monster and the cunning of the victim. And I taped that line to my computer because I felt like that is exactly what I wanted to do. I did not want to write a black and white, I'm, you know, so sweet, she was so bad. Because we were in this thing together. I mean, I feel like on some way it was so, it's going to sound crazy, but it was so thrilling for me to be involved as a teenager. It was like we were on some mother-daughter version of Thelma and Louise, and <laughs> I was the girl behind the getaway car, you know, just <laughs> waiting to pound on the gas yeah. whenever, you know, some something caused her to come flying, which happened a lot. And I think probably somewhere in there we both knew about the cliff we were going to head off to. Um, but it was really like 
an incredibly uh, exciting time of my life, which I know sounds crazy. Has your daughter read the book? You know, it's interesting. So one morning this summer, I came out just sort of out into the living room area, and there she was with the book in hand, and the book's available to her whenever she wants. And she was reading it, and um, she said she really liked it, and then she put it down. And what I thought is, um, I kind of gave myself a little high five because I also thought like, I am so glad she's not obsessed with my internal life quite the way I was obsessed with my mother's internal <laughs> life. I think she might finish it. You know, she's much more fascinated by science fiction and mm. mythology and some other books. So I don't imagine this is sort of right up her alley. I'm sure she'll read it. And you know, if she does, that's fine. She does know the story. Um, but if she doesn't, I'm also completely fine with that. I. You know, I grew up with a father who'd written probably seven or eight books, you know, before I was really, uh, you know, a big reader myself. And I didn't read all of them until I was an adult. So. It's just the family biz. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. This was just wonderful. And we never, as narrators, we almost never get to meet the authors. And I love this book so much. It's so special. And I just can't wait to see how it does out in the world. So thank you. And thank you. I cannot wait to hear uh. you reading the book. <laughs> and I'm just thrilled and I'm so happy you were able to do it. And I really, I'm full of gratitude. Oh gosh, absolutely. Mm -hmm.